Hi, I'm Paul Baxendale, and welcome to the second part of my three-part series of talking about the role of anabolic steroids in my bodybuilding career, which began in the 1980s, drug-free, and then moving over to the dark side, using anabolics in the early 90s, and eventually taking us right up to date in the final part, part three of the series. Now, last time we left off with me having purchased a whole bin liner full of anabolic steroids and other performance enhancing drugs from a French pharmacy in Cannes. And I just left the chemist to return to the UK with an offer from the pharmacist that I could order from him any time in the future and he would dispatch the order in a box to me at my address in the UK. Now luckily, my girlfriend at the time, who was with me in France, had no problem with me doing all of this. She had been with me through my initial decision to begin using anabolics, and so had been through the entire journey with me so far. Although not a bodybuilder, she trained and she did like the way my physique was changing and seeing me progress in the world. And she had no problem in me taking it back home with us. Now I knew, I knew that they were legal for personal use. And so I should have no problem bringing them back with me on my person into England. So we focused on enjoying the rest of the week in Cannes as a young couple should do. It was romantic, almost surreal, and so we dressed up like movie stars for a few days, being photographed and signing autographs for people who had no idea who we were, but thought that we must be somebody. Now, as I stepped through customs at the airport through the nothing to declare, I must admit my heart was probably racing and pounding a little bit, as although I knew it was legal, I didn't want to have to be stopped and to explain to the customs officers and then be delayed because of it all. As it was, there was nothing to worry about. And I strolled through with my suitcase, jam packed, full of anabolics, all neatly lined up in boxes surrounded with my clothes. <laughs> now, when I returned home, I called my friend, Graham Black in Newbury, rest in peace Graham, to tell him what I'd been able to pick up over there. And to say he was jealous was a tiny understatement. Apparently, parabolon and testosterone heptalate were extremely difficult to get hold of in the UK. And they were costing at least three times the amount that I had paid in the French pharmacy. Now that contact I had in France lasted me for six years until one day when I phoned the pharmacist, he explained to me that the French government had recently passed through laws making the selling of anabolics illegal without a doctor's prescription. So he was no longer able to supply me anything. Now that was the same pretty much across many countries in Europe all at that time. What previously had been quite legal products to buy over the counter at pharmacies had now become illegal. I think it was due to the bad press many sports were getting on athletes, especially Olympic athletes who were supposed to be clean and were having been found to be using performance enhancing drugs. The result of this sadly wasn't what the governments had wanted, which was top athletes in drug tested sports to stop taking them but it meant that instead of genuine pharmaceutical companies producing these products many found their demand obviously dropped so they stopped the production of some products for example parabolon and testosterone heptalate were stopped and so instead underground laboratories often just people with basic chemistry knowledge began making products and they filled 10 
mill multi-dose bottles with these products. Now the athletes didn't stop taking the products, they simply found a different source for them and sadly one that was less sterile and also without stringent quality control over the dosages per milligram. So when you thought you were taking say 250 milligrams of Sustanon, instead you may be only getting 70 milligrams of Sustanon. Now today's market is predominantly filled with underground labs and multivials. Although I'm sure most are genuine with what they claim to contain, sometimes less scrupulous manufacturers will replace an expensive product like Prima Bolan Depot with a cheaper powder like testosterone propionate, which can have devastating impacts not only on your physique, but it's also highly dangerous. For example, if a female bodybuilder thinks she's taking 10 milligrams of Winstrol, but instead in the tablet is 10 milligrams of Dianabol, which can have masculinizing effects. Hence, unwittingly, the athlete begins to suffer from a deepening of the voice, a loss of hair and increased facial hair, let alone the changes to her sex organs, which I won't go into here. So the market today is a minefield. But let's go back to the early 90s again and see what I did for my first off season with anabolic steroids. Now I'd ask Graham for advice on what I should start my next off season cycle with. Now that I had access to all types of these exotic drugs to my disposal. Now he recommended the testosterone heptalate which came three ampules in a box and they were each 250 milligram per ampule. Now he suggested two ampules of those a week and trying the Prima Bolan Depot ampules of 100 milligrams, <clears throat> each along with that at three times a week. So a total of 500 milligrams of testosterone and 300 milligrams of Primo Depot for four weeks, and then to take testosterone enanthate twice a week and change the Primo to Deca again at a total of 500 milligrams of testosterone and 400 milligrams of Deca but then to add the andriol capsules of 40 milligrams of testosterone under canoate at one per day to take the total testosterone to 780 milligrams a week. Now this stat was an interesting one for me. The heptalate seemed like rocket fuel and added to the primo, I was growing like crazy, but also keeping very dry, adding about two pounds a week, which doesn't sound that much, but my strength was noticeably increasing, suggesting I was putting on good quality muscle tissue. The results from the second phase, however, were a little bit less noticeable, and I must say a bit disappointing compared to the first part of the cycle. My testosterone levels didn't appear to be any higher than they were at 500 milligrams a week, and the DECA combined seemed to give me much more water retention than running the Primo and the Heptalate. Now I was soon to discover that for whatever reason, me and Decker just didn't get on particularly well. Just a genetic thing maybe, but I knew that my body was responding great to the Heptalate ether of testosterone very well, and in a much more dynamic fashion than the Enanthate and the Undecanoate versions that were in the, in the ampules and the capsules. As it turned out, there was some research done to suggest that taking testosterone orally was an inefficient way of getting it into your body, as a certain amount was damaged or wasted through the digestive process. Still, it was all a learning curve and a learning game. I was the experiment. <laughs> I kept the news of my new contact to myself pretty much, as for obvious reasons, it wasn't information you wanted people who weren't within the inner sanctum of the top bodybuilding circle to know about. 
so only a couple of people knew about it. But at the same time, bodybuilding back then was very much a brotherhood and a sisterhood of iron, in that you got to know who you could trust. And that was not very many people at all. But those who were in the circle, I help, we would help each other out with knowledge and there were the occasional swapping of products too. If somebody had a contact for one item, then you would swap with something that you could access, but they couldn't. There was very little selfishness in the sport back then. I know for sure that no one thought along the lines of keeping things to themselves to get an advantage over a, another top competitor. We all knew that drugs were literally just the 10% icing on the cake of years of brutal training and hard dieting and no drug was going to help anyone get that much bigger or leaner by, by itself. The size and condition came from the basics. Eating right 365 days a year and training as hard as anyone else could. In fact, it was really thought that it was the ones who trained the hardest were the ones who grew the most. And they were right. And I still believe that to be the case today. Anyway, I decided to test the ordering system with my French pharmacist friend to see if it did work and whether the pharmacist in can was both good to his word and if the beauty products custom label would get through customs as he said it would it was going to risk it was going to mean risking a little bit of money but it was a legitimate pharmacy and i had met him and i did feel comfortable in trying it all out i telephoned the number on his card and a young lady answered in french quickly trying to remember my o level french i blurted out something like bonjour C'est possible parler avec le pharmaciste? Je suis anglais et moi parler français un petit peu. She said something quickly I didn't understand, but then a man's voice came on the line saying, Hello, this is Gerald, the pharmacist. I explained in English that I had visited him the month before and could I place an order please for some more testosterone products? and anabolique produit <laughs> he laughed and said ah yes of course yes if you give me a list of what you want and the quantities then i will order them and get them shipped to your address so i gave him the list of products the quantities and my address and then i paid by visa card he said it should be with me in around 10 to 14 days and to call again when I wanted to place another order. Well, that was a lot easier than I'd expected. Now all I had to do was to wait to see whether or not the products came through or not. About 10 days later, I received a knock at the door. It was the mailman with a large cardboard box, well taped up and with a French stamp on the front and a custom sticker which read beauty products i couldn't wait to see what was inside i cut the box open and there in front of me were lines and lines of boxes neatly lined up everything i had ordered was there including a little note thanking me for the order and welcoming any future business well that was that. I no longer needed to worry about how to get hold of my anabolics, nor whether they were genuine or not. Straight from the pharmacy, I could now get hold of anything that was made legitimately by a pharmaceutical company anywhere in the world. From anabolics to androgens, vitamins, minerals, growth hormone, EPO, diuretics and everything in between now that contact lasted me several years and hence gives me question 
a big question about the legitimacy of the product used today. For you see, me and all the other people using these products from the pharmacist never ever used more than a thousand milligrams of testosterone per week ever. Well, if they did, they were buying extra from elsewhere and I don't see why they would have done that when they could get the real thing guaranteed to be genuine. The only reason would be that they wanted to take more than what they wanted me to think they were taking. And the people who were using this, these were not the type of people who would do that. Now, honestly, I did once try a cycle taking my testosterone levels to over 1000 milligrams a week up to 1250 milligrams and it made no difference at all in terms of gains but it did make me feel less well i think they called it test flu it was a good lesson to learn for me a thousand milligrams of test for me was the absolute most i was ever going to use and for most of my courses, I actually kept the test levels lower than that at around 500 to 750 milligrams per week to allow me to use higher quantities of more anabolic compounds. My total anabolic intake weekly varied off season and pre-contest, but off season, all compounds included, it would total around 1,200 to 1300 milligrams and pre-contest normally less since the compounds were shorter acting and generally lower in amount so totals of about 1000 milligrams tops normally 300 milligrams of test propionate 300 milligrams of primo depot and 150 milligrams of winstrol or possibly 20 milligrams a day of anavar tablets now remember tablets came in 2.5 milligrams then so we would never have gone over the 1000 milligram a week mark pre-contest now does that sound high or low to you compared to what i've told and heard of what's taken today those are kind of laughable dosages and yet are physiques any smaller or worse than the majority of those today i i'd say ours were on the whole better drier more aesthetic maybe not quite as big but with much better conditioning on the whole the differences with today i'll discuss a bit later for now let's go back to the 90s and the temple gym when i began training at temple gym i obviously never talked about gear until the point where it was being openly discussed in front of me as then i knew that I was trusted in their inner circle. And that didn't happen for at least six months. When we were sat around the table one day and the subject came up, I thought, well, if they're trusting me enough to talk about it in front of me and accept me into their inner circle, then I was happy enough to tell them about my contact in France. As by the sounds of it, although anabolics were not difficult to get hold of, the variety of products available did seem limited they could get a testosterone propionate it was called viramone deca and testosterone enanthate all from a chemist in birmingham but anything else was got through mutual acquaintances and the prices although cheaper than on the market were still higher than the price at the point of sale in the chemist in france so I offered my help if anybody wanted to swap anything they had for anything that they weren't able to get hold of. It was well appreciated by the team there. Indeed, by everyone in the small circle of people who gathered around the table after we'd finished training. Now, I want to make it clear that although, yes, obviously some people were in the business of selling anabolics as a sideline to help with the cost of their training and food etc during this time i never sold any of the products that i got from france i had a full-time job and then i owned my own gym so i was in no need to make extra money through selling anabolics at that time at other times in my life as a gym owner it may have been different 
I won't ever lie to you, you know that. So I guess for now, all I'm going to say is I'll plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> the most popular products that were being swapped in Temple Gym that I, were, I was aware of were Parabolon and Heptilate. The Heptilate was about three pounds per ampule on the box in francs obviously but the parabolon was the most expensive product per ampule at around i think about four pound fifty it equated to per ampule so it was so effective we knew the raw ingredients must have been more expensive because the pharmacist didn't set the price the pharmaceutical company did again any products were never sold within simple within temple gym i'm sure the members respected dorian and the gym too much to do so but again with the small circle of friends that i was around we were just iron brothers helping each other out for example one of the lads in temple could get viramone cheaper than i could get in france so we would use his sauce and his deca was also cheaper from his British pharmacist but all the difficult to get products when there was a third party involved always meant that my French pharmacist source was cheaper so that's what it remained a small group of bodybuilders helping each other out by swapping bits and pieces to help everyone get the best quality products as cheaply as possible from my side of the swap the most popular products in Temple Gym at that time were definitely testosterone, heptilate and parabolon. But what was more important than how we sourced them was how we should be using them. So obviously we would then start talking about courses and how much people advised and what and what the products they used alongside others. It was it was normally always a standard testosterone base normally 500 to 700 milligrams up to a thousand milligrams per week and then we would run alongside that some type of high anabolic compound either deca not me because i'd already worked out that deca didn't work for me primo depot winstrol mastron or equipoise orals orals were sometimes used to boost a course but we were all very aware of their increased liver toxicity over injectables. So we didn't overly use orals like Dianabol, Anavar, Andriol or Stenazolol. The other thing about orals was that Andriol was the only one that came from an actual pharmacy. The others were being made by underground pharmaceutical companies. It was real product but because they didn't come directly from a pharmacy, we were a little more reluctant to use them. If anything, I would sometimes add Dianabol to an off-season course and add Anavar to a pre-contest course. The Anavar was real, but they came in tablets of 2.5 milligram. So we would take perhaps four a day which when you think of the cycles today, 10 milligrams of Anavar a day would probably be laughed at by today's bodybuilders. <laughs> but that's what it was like. Real product works. And if you really need six 10 milligram Dianabol tablets a day to get any effect, then I would suggest those Dianabol tablets are not 10 milligrams each. Ours were five milligrams per tablet and we would max out at six a day which equated to 30 milligrams of Dianabol a day and then we would taper down by two a week going down to four a day and then down to two a day and then one a day as that's how what we were told was best to come off a cycle gradually taper the dosages down and of course People are going to want to know if I spoke with Dorian about anabolics and other performance enhancing drugs. And yes, I did. Once he had accepted me into his small group of people who he had trained with 
and who would be fan, found sat around the table at the end of a session. As with most things, Dorian's advice was always simple, honest, and direct. He was very open with what he used, off-season, and for his Olympia prep. But there's no need for me to repeat those here, as he has written them down in a muscular development article for everyone to see. Now, when it came out, it wasn't surprising to hear Dawes received a lot of flack for that article due to many people not believing the dosages he stated. Some people literally calling him a liar. Probably those people who were not genetically gifted and were never meant to be a top level, level competitive bodybuilder anyway. All I can say is those amounts were the same as what he said to me. And Dorian, to my knowledge, never has lied to me about anything. So why would he lie about that to me? Especially at a time when we were all in it together. Him fighting to stay on top of the world of bodybuilding and me trying to get to the top of the national level of bodybuilding. I also know the things and amounts that he swapped with me. And they were in direct confirmation of the amounts he quoted in the article. I believe him 100%. If you knew him then, you would know that he just was not the type of guy to lie about anything. He didn't say much, but when he did say something, he meant it. And he was also very, very helpful, whether it was taking a look at me before a show or giving me advice on altering my diet to either increase fat loss or slow the fat loss down if he thought I was losing too quickly, which was often the case as I had a very fast metabolism. I would like to point out again that any information I'm giving here is not advice how to take these products. It's merely my history, my story, of how I personally use them. The world of the guys who helped me with advice and what I found to be the results and effects of using them. So that's how we took anabolics back in the early 90s. Of course, I haven't mentioned growth hormone, have I? Well, growth hormone was available from the French pharmacist, but the price was very expensive when compared to anything else we used back then. But there was a certain mystique with growth hormone. I think it was the name more than anything. But I was keen to try it, as rumour had it that the top, all the top pros were using it by now in their courses and seeing great improvements in size and helping them keep lean pre-contest. Well, I had spoken with Dorian about growth and he said that he had never used it until his first pro show, the Night of the Champions. And it was almost an unwritten rule that if you can't get your pro card without using growth hormone, then you are never going to be good enough as a pro anyway. So that's why I didn't use it for years. But eventually I decided to try it. The reports coming in were just too good to ignore. And I was obviously tempted. I asked Dorian how he took it. I asked Paul Borison. I asked Graham Black and I asked Kerry Case. And they all said vaguely similar things, but all with slightly different information, whether in terms of dosage or the time of day to take it. In the times it was administered, that was often different. Now, Paul said his research had suggested the morning was the best time, as at night time your body excreted your own natural growth hormone anyway, and he was concerned about exogenous growth hormones slowing down or halting the body's own natural release. But others said they took it in two doses, one in the morning and then at night, and the amounts were all about the same, either two I use if you could afford it, two I use in the morning, and then two I use at night time. And then somebody suggested using it every other day to create a pulsating rhythm. 
but that sounded to me a little bit like make-believe pharmacology I didn't understand it I wasn't a pharmacologist so I stuck with what the experts were advising I bought some and I decided to run it at two I use in the morning each day for a couple of months what you have to remember here as well and it's a very important point we were all very much our own experiments. There was very little written information about steroids and their practical application. There were so-called gurus like Dan Duchesne and Paul Borison, but how much of their knowledge was genuine, scientifically researched and proven in a real clinical environment was probably little to none. Even they were experimenting except they were experimenting on other bodybuilders. <laughs> That's why I chose so carefully those people who I went to for advice. Yes, Paul was one of them, but after one particularly unpleasant and dangerous incident, I decided that I had to take complete control myself and individual responsibility over my pharmaceutical intake. And so, Although I always remained friends with Paul and loved the guy to his dying day, I loved the guy. And I also admired him greatly for his incredible marketing and sales talents. I went to those people who I knew had had the results and were also looking incredibly healthy too. People like Graham, Kerry and Dorian. And even those people, I only ever sought out advice advice from just because they suggested something didn't mean I would do it but it did mean I would seriously contemplate it and if I thought it made sense and had minimal harm potential then I would make the decision whether to run with it or not what I see today is people handing over their individual responsibility for their own health to other people so-called gurus some who may have only one show experience in them some maybe have got no competitive experience in them do not ever ever hand over the responsibility for your health over to anyone be very careful who you choose as an advisor or a coach if you really think you need a coach obviously back then none of us ever had a coach and I think we did okay, don't you? <laughs> I've got more to say on growth hormone and other substances, but I think I'll leave this episode here for now and complete the story in the third and the final segment of this series, which will be available to you also now. But finally, let me leave you with a short quote from Marcus Aurelius on the fact that there is no shame in needing to ask for help. Don't be ashamed of needing help. You have a duty to fulfill, just like a soldier on the wall of battle. So what if you are injured and can't climb up without another soldier's help? And hopefully this series will give you some help in distinguishing between the hype in the bodybuilding and fitness world today in the advices going around by the many different coaches and gurus and the advice of an older generation who were no less passionate about the sport than you but were who were also prepared to take total individual responsibility for all of our actions and therefore we chose our help very very carefully Thank you for watching and listening once again. I'll see you in part three. Goodbye.